You're looking at episode 7 of Ep Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and today is August 31st, 2015. With me today are Megan Arns. Hello. Laurel Black. Hi. And Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. Great. So our guest today was recently appointed at the University of California, Long Beach, but today is joining us from Boca Raton, Florida, where he also teaches at the Lynn Conservatory. He is former principal of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, frontman and founder of the, of the alternative rock band NICO, and he's the creator and director of the Ted Adcats Percussion Seminar. Uh, Ted Adcats, how's it going? Great. Thanks for having me, Casey, and hello, everybody. Cool. So Ted and I did, well, Ted did the, um, of course, runs the the seminar, the percussion seminar, but had me as a guest, and we got to hang out in Long Beach at his new program, and it was super, super cool. And Ted, I thought it'd be great if we started with a question from Jade Hales, which was simply, tell us about TAPS. Yeah. Thank you for the question, Jade. And uh, yeah, thank you all for having me here. It's, a, it's an honor to be a part of the podcast. Um, TAPS, I, I came up with as a, a means to bring a bunch of different ideas and a bunch of different artists who do different stuff and try and inspire percussionists, college level and high school level. Um, I think the first one was enormously successful in that Casey, Casey played a huge part in it. And Casey, as for those of you that don't know Casey, he does something is, that's completely unique. Uh, and he's a true artist. Um, but I would say that's that was true of all the the clinicians and artists that we had, and they they each brought something different. So it wasn't just an orchestral percussion seminar, which is sort of what I'm known for doing. Um, you know, because I, I started you know my my career started in the Chicago Symphony. But um, what I loved about all my teachers and all of my idols was that they were involved in a bunch of different types of music. So Taps really brought all sorts of different things. Um, we had a jazz vibraphonist, uh, Nick Mancini. We brought Matt Straussen, who did a timpani clinic. Casey did his thing, whatever that is. I don't even know how to describe it. Um, I talked about uh, you know, uh, taking auditions and, and uh, dealing with performance anxiety. And we covered a lot of ground. And it was too much for anyone to absorb all of it. But I think the, the core, at the core of it was that it inspired everyone that was there including us and that's that was the thing I loved the most about it was that uh, all the all the clinicians sat through all every class and uh, got so much out of it so I was inspired and humbled throughout the week and I think every student felt the same way yeah absolutely and I, I, I couldn't agree more if anyone out there is considering going to taps like definitely consider it for sure it was it was really really great it was absolutely fantastic and I, I love the message of like the the multifaceted percussionist because it's so easy to s just say oh I, I really want an orchestra job so I'm gonna go study with Ted Atkats and like learn all the secrets but the thing I always discover is when I meet these heavy orchestra cats like Ted they are so much more than what you what you thought oh well that's that's nice of you to say um, yes um, yeah I mean I I grew up you know playing a bunch of different types of music, and I had no idea I was going to be, a, be an orchestra musician. I mean, I, I, think, I think a lot of young people are trying to find their way. And, uh, yeah, so, so to, to finish with my thought about TAPS is just that it basically gave people sort of a, a launching pad to discover their interests. And, um, but, yeah, I think now more than ever, it's, there's, you can't do it just one way, and you, have, you, you need to find other aspects of percussion and, and uh, you know Casey and, and Ben both of you are proof of you're doing a variety of different types of playing and writing and and I think that uh, students were inspired to do a, a lot of different stuff not just to say I want to be an orchestral musician wait yeah. what is what does Ben do I, I don't I don't know <laughs> Actually, if, if I could add to that for a minute one thing that, that I found fascinating um, my my first experience with Ted Atkats, which I'll talk about in a bit when we get to my segment, but when I first read his bio, I always knew Ted as like, you know, again, like the hardcore orchestral percussionist type, you know, a Tom Freer type or Chris Lamb type in that category. It's like super orchestra super, jock. Super orchestra jock. Hardcore. But then I read his bio and <laughs> I read Excuse me. I need to. I need to warm <laughs> He's up. He's gotta go. <laughs> I'll let him speak. I'll be over here. <laughs> but I, I read his bio, and Ted started 
as a stand-up comedian. You know, um, Ted started as an elementary school music <laughs> teacher. That was his uh, his first gig, which you can tell kids would love. <laughs> and then, oh, kids love me! In addition to that, I'm fun. You're you're a long distance runner, right? You run marathons in theory, yeah. In theory, or you have run marathons. Yeah. There's there's so much more to this person. And there was actually a Facebook question that I think was kind of a joke, but as a serious question, like you balance like having a family life and doing all these educational things, teaching at two or three different universities, playing with major symphony orchestras and all this. So it's like, it's quite impressive to me that in addition to being like the, the orchestra jock, so to speak, you can do all this other stuff, including balancing like a normal person life, which is often lost on musicians and percussionists, especially, I think. Yeah. Well, man, thank you for calling me normal. You are so <laughs> off base. I can't even tell you. Okay to tell you um, well you know it's it is you know we all know as musicians it's really it's really hard to to fit it all in and so you you're constantly making choices and you, you do have to sacrifice in other areas but I think we all know that it they all sort of work together yeah, yeah. you know you're you're um, you're inspired and, and and you're directed by your other musics and you bring them to whatever you're doing as, as a performer or as a teacher so I think that's that's a big component of it yeah, excellent. Uh, hey, Ben, would you like to share your history segment with us? Yeah, sure. So, like I said, I, I had my first Ted Adcats experience was, uh, I guess it was last year, Ted Adcats. In quotes. <laughs> so called Ted Adcats. Experience. My first Ted Adcats experience was last year, uh, Ted played the Christopher Rouse Percussion Concerto at Lynn Conservatory. Um, and that was my first time actually meeting Ted in person. Um, so, because it was a concerto on my mind, I wanted to talk about a concerto today. So we're going to talk today about the first ever marimba concerto, which I think is actually, I'm trying to maybe focus on lesser known works on these segments, but this is a pretty well known one. The Creston Marimba Concertino, which was written in 1940. It was commissioned by Frederic Petrides, who was uh, the director of a 30 person all female orchestra called the Orchestrette Classique in New York City. Um, Paul Creston was born Giuseppe Gudovergi. He was an Italian. I didn't um, know this. Yeah, but like like many uh, people in the you know beginning of the 20th century, ethnic groups were kind of frowned upon. So just like George Gershwin, just like Aaron Copeland, he he changed his name to an American sounding name, which was Paul Creston. Um, he trained as a pianist and organist, but was actually not formally trained in composition or theory, which I found. Shocking because he's so well known for his you know exploration of forms and so on and he wrote a lot of concertos for what he considered neglected instruments So he has a marimba concerto trombone harp accordion and saxophone pieces um, The concerto was written for Ruth Stuber who later married and her name became Ruth Jean So sometimes you see both names. It's the same person um, And I didn't know this either Ruth Stuber had studied with both Claire Omar Musser in Chicago and George Hamilton Green in New York um, and she had played in the Musser uh, King George Orchestra. Um, so I, there was a lot of stuff about Ruth Stuber that I was not aware of. Um, I also found it fascinating. One thing we've talked about before is it's kind of hard to support yourself as a, as a young musician. And when Ruth Jean moved to New York City, uh, she worked at Macy's two days a week. She taught at a small school in Long Island. And she was a member of this orchestra classique, which also gave her some money. So she had kind of, you know, her hands in a lot of different things trying to make a living. Um, so the concerto was premiered April 29th, 1940. It was supposed to be recorded, but the engineer was an idiot and recorded the piece after it, so there's no recording of the first oh, no. performance of the Creston Marimba Concertino. Um, she played from memory, which again, I found that fascinating because it's hard enough to memorize pieces now, back then when technique wasn't as developed, I, you know, I can't imagine. She played it on a four and a third octave marimba, which she had gotten as part of that Musser Marimba Orchestra, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, in, on a future date. Um, but there's a glissando at the end of the, I think it's the end of the first movement, um, and it starts on a low F. And the reason is that her marimba went to a low F, which is actually the F below middle C, not low F like we think of today. Um, but so that gliss isn't supposed to start on F, as you might think. It's just the lowest note of the keyboard that she had. Um, so anyway, the first and third movements are two mallet movements. They're very kind of George Hamilton Green in style. The, the second movement is a lyrical soft movement for four mallets, which she played with uh, wool-wrapped mallets. The other movements 
she played with rubber mallets, except for there's a small lyrical portion of the first movement which she used wool mallets on. Um, and when Creston was composing it, he would uh, simulate marimba technique by using two fingers or four fingers on piano, um, and he would bring parts of it to her and she would you know, try it and show him how it worked and so on. I also found that Creston would play the accompaniment, the orchestral accompaniment on organ, and play the two mallet parts with his feet, which seems quite difficult because it's quite brisk. Um, it was the concertina was received very well um, on its first performance. It was called The Novelty of the Evening and an Interesting Experiment, um, but it, it did have positive praise. Uh, positive praise sorry. And um, one thing I found interesting is John Cage actually later approached Ruth Jean and asked her to assist in the production of an all percussion concert at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and she played the, she called it marimba part, but I know it as the xylophone part on Henry Cowell's Ostinato Pianissimo. On the premiere of that, she played that xylophone part, if you're familiar with that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that is the Creston Marimba Concertino and Ruth Stewart Jean in a nutshell. Wow. And nice. I have to say, actually, my first experience, uh, performance ever of a concerto was the Creston Marimba Concertino. So have any of you guys played the Creston by any chance? Yes, that was also my first experience. Hey, yep. Yeah, me, <laughs> yeah, me too. Was it your first concerto ever? Yeah, I never, I never performed the whole thing, but I auditioned uh, with it. Yeah. And uh, didn't get very far. Yeah, I think I only but, played the uh, third movement, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Mine was the Rosaro. It's you know. Oh, lame. <laughs> Dude, it's cooler, man. Not everyone okay. can keep up with Casey Candrelosi. It's true. <laughs> Hey, um, let's see. What was I going to ask? Uh, hey, Ben, where did you find all this cool information? This was, there were several Percussive Notes articles throughout the years written on the Crescent Marimba Concertino. There was actually an interview with Ruth Stuber, um, and there were a couple other articles. There was one when Paul Creston died. The manuscript of the concerto is actually in the Percussive Arts Society archives um, in Indianapolis, which I think I remember seeing when I was there in, like, the Rhythm Museum. Um, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, I want to go back to taps just for a second, because Ted, you have a new taps that's uh, going to occur in January. Do you want to tell us uh, who sure. and? Um, yes, sir. And you're coming too, Casey. I'm coming. Yeah, I'll be there, buddy. Like you're not. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we're we're uh, we're headed to uh, Australia. Um, we're going to be there uh, January second through the seventh. And uh, we have a slightly different lineup, and we're still kind of finalizing all the details. But, um, yeah, we, I really wanted to make sure that TAPS was going to be um, an international seminar. Uh, ben and I were talking about it, and, and my, experience with, um, uh, my experience with teaching abroad is that uh, students were, were really in need of sort of the education that, that we have here. Um, I think that you know, certainly or the orchestral side of things. I think, I feel like uh, the education that we're getting in the States is is uh, the best. Uh, so I always found going to places like Hong Kong and going to Australia that students were really getting a lot out of what we were bringing. So I knew that making this national seminar was, was important to me. So um, based on the success of, of the first one in Long Beach, I knew that we, we wanted to keep the ball rolling. And so we've got a lot of interest so far and we've got some some support um, uh, my my the companies that's that uh, that endorse that I endorse um, have been really generous with in giving products and giving help uh, support to the artists so um, I knew we wanted to keep it going so yeah we'll be in Australia we'll be back in Long Beach in next July uh, but yeah coming right up man I, I hope you have your plane ticket Casey it's a long flight I think it was a really good move to not invite Sean back. That was real smart. Are you talking about Sean Tilburg? Ugh. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have him on actually. He's he's I, I think he's finalized, but he'll be he'll be on soon and Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So um, we should... you let him know. You let him make sure that he sees this podcast before he gets on so his confidence is really low. I wanna wreck it. We're I'm hoping to just vibe him out completely right. Oh now. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. waiting for I'm waiting for you to do that to me, but you've only got another <laughs> 25 minutes, so you better get right to it. It's hard to. <laughs> I tried to vibe you out all through taps. It was it was hard. Oh no, um, I, I, no, you can't get you can't get to me, man. 
I I know people. I don't know how much you want to. <laughs> I don't know how much you want to talk about, or, or how much you can talk about. But I, I've had several people ask me, uh, like several other adults, like professional, you know, pr professional percussionists, ask. Supposedly know stuff. Yeah, like like real like real percussionists, you know, like. Uh -huh. like but they, but they want to know, like, how did you fund... They basically want to know, like, dude, how did he get it together financially to pull taps off? Because um, we know it was like you took really good care of everybody and, um, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a pretty elaborate event um, and really ambitious, especially for a first time ever. Um, can you... Can, I don't know. Can you tell us something? Yeah, I have my uh, my family is uh, is for, I'm fourth generation um, coal miner, and we have an incredible business. Uh, West no, and, no. Okay, you're right. No, it's not that. Oh uh, no, I'm not giving away any secrets, man. No. Okay. I, and everyone's gonna do taps. I can't do that. Uh. Give me some more softball questions. I want marshmallows. <laughs> I want like easy questions. More Facebook questions. Yeah, man. I taps is all about love. It's about love and percussion and love of percussion. I don't want to talk about money. Come on, right. man. Yeah, all right. Well, well no, um, I, I, will, I will tell you this. As I mentioned, all right, so seriously, um, uh, the artists were, in my opinion, uh, very generous with their time. I mean, it, you know, Casey was one of them, and all the people that were there put in a lot of hours beyond what they were paid. Uh, but as I mentioned, the, you know, companies like uh, Vic Firth and... Uh, and Majestic and Zildjian are, are some of the many companies, Remo, uh, that were really supportive of the idea. The other thing is that um, I found that you know being out in the West Coast, it's a very different atmosphere for uh, percussion, for, for young percussionists, and I felt that um, the West Coast really needed a percussion seminar like this. So when I mentioned it to companies, particularly Remo being a, a California-based company, they were way into the idea. So they got behind it right away. Um, but yeah, we we're, support is coming from a lot of different areas, but we try and keep the the, the tuition or the, the the cost for the seminar affordable for students. Um, my dream is to have it be fully um, full fellowship, so that people can apply to to be in TAPS and and come for free. Um, whether that I, you know that's that's a ways away, but I'm working on getting uh, private um, sponsorship, and I'm I'm work. It's a nonprofit organization, and I'm seeking funding, so uh, yeah, the the goal is that we're we're going to to be fully funded so that students don't have to pay anything. Additionally, about taps, I I want to reach people that don't get the kind of music education you know at all that 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 most of us have been lucky enough to receive, and so I, I want to take it to parts of the world and parts of America that where students really need to be exposed to music, and we all all of us as percussionists know how much how important being musicians has been for us and how life-changing it's been. Um, and I think you can actually affect lives in a positive way when you're talking about people that don't have the the resources to get an education in music that, that we've had access to. See, that's all I wanted you to say. I don't know why you had to get all mafia weird about it. That's all I wanted. That's all I was interested in. I just want to um, be as diva diva-esque and difficult in this podcast as possible. What's wrong with that? Hey, uh, Megan, do you have a segment this week? I don't remember. Yes, I do. So speaking Save us, of, Megan. Yeah, save us speaking before you. Speaking of money and um, funding things, and um, I wanted to talk about student loan debt forgiveness today because even though that's not necessarily a current event, it's a current event in my life, and I'm sure it's a current event in a lot of people's lives who have attended uh, music school. So um, I, since graduating, uh, have been looking into how in the world I'm going to pay my student loans on the salary that I have, and uh, especially when I was unemployed before, and I started really freaking out about it, and um, spent a lot of time researching it and talking to a lot of people, and now after re um, doing a lot of this research myself and talking to friends, I'm noticing that a lot of people are not aware of some of the programs that are available to us. So I wanted to share a little bit what I have found so far. So uh, let's see here. 
Well, you know, um, while, you, I, while you're searching, I'll just I'll just say I I hear students and and, and of course uh, you know professionals talk about this all the time, and a lot of them just have an attitude of like, you know, they can't possibly do this to all of us. Enough of us are in this debt situation that oh uh, it, it'll work itself out. There's no way we're all going to actually have to pay this back. But I'm not so sure. <laughs> like I think, you yeah, should, Megan is. You probably have to do something about this. Yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit in that boat, too, of, like, how could this be possible? Like, what do they have to take away from me? But I think there are some things that we can do to protect us now. And then even though this program um, has not been enacted for 10 years, so we don't know if anyone has actually completed this program yet, I think it takes no money and relatively little effort to get into this program. Um, so I think this is the answer to paying as much uh, to paying as little as possible of your student loans over the, over the course of 10 years. If you have a lot of loans, like I do, and if you work full-time at a public school or a nonprofit with a 501c3 status, like many of us do. So uh, when you basically, when you graduate, if you do not have a plan and you do not select a plan manually, you'll be placed on the standard repayment plan, and um, which will have your loans paid off in 10 years. There is no way I can afford this amount. And I think for a lot of artists, a lot of musicians, there's no way we can afford this amount. So a lot of people um, opt for the income-driven repayment plan. So basically, they take a percentage of your income, and they make the plan affordable for you. The problem is that interest is still accruing during this time. So it's just really like prolonging and prolonging this. So there is actually a 20-year... Uh, debt forgiveness plan if you make these payments on time. However, there is a plan called the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, and this actually decreases the time to 10 years. And this program forgives the remaining balance on your direct loans after you have made 120 qualifying monthly payments under a qualifying repayment plan while working full-time for a qualifying employer. Okay, what does all that mean? <laughs> there are a lot of questions in there. So what is a full-time qualifying employer? Basically, if you work for a nonprofit organization, a public institution that has a 501c3 status, you're good. So I work for University of Missouri, a public institution. It's still a nonprofit organization. So what I have to do is um, download a form, and my employer basically has to verify that I have worked here over the course of the year, and then those those payments count. Um, but backing up for just a second, um, what do you do first? The first thing to do is once you graduate and you think you might qualify for this plan, um, you have to find a, a loan servicer and consolidate your loans. So when I graduated, I had um, Nelnet was my loan servicer, and each of these public loan servicers specialize in something different. So I think Nelnet was disability. Um, and Fed Loan Servicing is this fed, uh, public service loan forgiveness program. That's their specialty. So I had to transfer all my loans to Fed Loan Servicing. And I basically called them and I just asked a million questions, like numerous times. You know, I talked to one person, got a lot of information, and I thought I would call again to get a little bit more information. And I spent a lot of time on the phone and it really was a pain in the butt but I got a lot of information in the end that was not I could not find online. So once you transfer your loans, you also have to consolidate your loans. So if you have private loans, sorry, this probably is not going to work for you. Um, they have to be direct loans. So you have to consolidate your loans to be direct loans. Um, and the problem with this is that I hadn't paid anything yet, so that was fine. However, if you have made payments before, and then you consolidate your loans, they don't count towards qualifying payments. So you've made payments, that's fine, the money has gone away, but it doesn't count towards your 120 payments. Um, so yeah, you basically you need to get on the public loan service forgiveness plan, you need to get on the income-based repayment plan, and then you have to make the 120 qualifying payments. And once you do that, once you make the 120 qualifying payments, you have to uh, submit a form and basically applying for loan forgiveness. And this, uh, this application is actually still under development and it will be available 
prior to October 2017, which is the date when the first borrowers, the borrowers will become eligible for this program. So kind of the moral of the story is, you know, don't pay a lot of money if you don't have to. I really believe that if you are an artist or a musician and you're not making the type of money that maybe a doctor or a lawyer or someone in a profession that's making a lot of money will make, uh, and you have a lot of loans, like a lot of us do, that there is a way to that this this will be forgiven. But I think just blindly making payments as we get paid, I just think it's not the right way to do it. So I spent a lot of time on the phone, and it was a pain in the butt, but I think you should not give up in getting on this plan, and I think it's worth it in the end. It's nice to know about this because, you know, in our field in education, you know, we hear so much about recruitment and retention and and things like that. And it's always been in the back of my mind, like music is is such a scary field to go into, and you just worry about the amount of jobs there are in general, proportionate to the amount of graduates, then all this thing, and then you 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 look at that and then compare that to taking a risk like a loan, mm -hmm. and it's like, oh man, it just the numbers suggest it's not a good idea, but it's it's really nice to to have information about alternatives and like ways you can be smart about dealing with it, um, and also just knowing that you know the more people I talk to around here, like every student I've met here, they're all working summer drumline camps, they're mm -hmm. all teaching lessons, they're all doing so much stuff, and and there's a really strong alumni network here. It's it's been great to discover just how healthy the area is, and I feel so much better about like this whole situation um, than I than I did in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. But it would be really great, like if you're talking to a prospective student, um, to like tell them like there is this such a thing, and actually I kind of know a little bit about it. So I, I don't know, that's 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 cool, man. Yeah, I think it's really important, and I think you know we all have to do this exit loan counseling. And I think that this was maybe an option, but I just don't remember anyone ever in person being like, it's going to be okay. There's this program that actually is geared exactly towards what you do um, that can help you. I just don't remember anyone. And like I said, I've been freaked out about this really for a, a year and a half. And everyone that I've talked to been like, hey, I feel, I feel like I'm getting, I feel like I'm onto something. No one has, not one person have I met that is actually on this plan. I'm sure there are a lot of people on the plan, but no one that I've talked to is like actually signed up and registered and making qualifying payments towards this to be um, resolved at the end of 10 years. Yeah, and so. I, I was going to excuse me. I was going to say I think the great thing, Megan, is that you know that the fact that you called and you you asked a lot of questions, and I'm talking to my students a lot these days about about loans and about debt and. Um, I, I keep going back to the same thing, which is make some phone calls, make inquiries, find out about uh, what your options are. Some students are saddled with loans, others and are in a situation like you're talking about, Megan. Others are are afraid to take out uh, loans because of the fear of of having ten thousand dollars in in debt or 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 even less sometimes and. I had to take out loans. I think most of us did um, during our schooling. But it, I think uh, you guys too, maybe. Or were you guys really special and just full scholarship your entire lives? Because no, 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 no. Well, actually. Yeah, see? Uh, see, there you go. <laughs> uh, well, no, but, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really important to ask questions. I find that um, musicians are generally terrible with finances. Uh, and one of the reasons is that we you know, we get deep into our craft, we get deep in the practice room, we get deep into music, and we 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 don't attach the importance of uh, saving, of spending, of, of of managing your finances. And I think that's so important, uh, especially with people that are, uh, you know, starting a group, starting an ensemble. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I I we were talking about taps. I I learned a lot about about finances and and. Uh, my wife can tell you that you know she had to show me how to use an Excel spreadsheet because I I had never used one. Um, but yeah, I think I think we all have to ask a lot of questions when we're dealing with loans. And I think the fact that uh, you're shedding light on this, Megan, is 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 great because I know it's a, it's going to be a huge problem moving forward, and not just for for musicians. I mean, there's plenty of people that yes. are getting business degrees and law degrees and 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 uh, 
in the medical profession that are not making enough money to pay their their loans and, and in some cases we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars so yeah yeah it's just a shame to see people throwing their money away in a program that seems to be designed for people like us uh -huh. you know but we're not educated on it and I just think to spend all of that extra money for no reason is just it, it what it's, a waste it's it's great I agree with you just you go you ask questions and you admit what you don't know yeah. Um, and and I, f I found whether it's like the guy coming to the house to change out our plug sockets, whether it's that or whether it's me going to the DMV, uh, whether it's me going to the office here to try to like get something happening that I don't understand, you just go there and say like, hey, I, can you help me? I, d I don't know what I'm doing regarding this, 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 and this. I, I defer to your expertise. And like people are usually so happy to help you. But if you go in there like pretending you know something, it, it just doesn't work as well. Like, just just admit what you don't know and get help. You know. Yeah. And young people, it's hard. I think it's hard for young people to do that because there's so much like self concern anyway, and there's so much question of like self worth about their musicianship or whatever. It is really hard to pick up the phone and be like, "Hey, I need I need help, and I I need I need your advice." Um, because all they've been told is like, oh, you need to be on top of this and you need to know what's going on. But it's like, if you don't know, do just admit you don't know and get the help. Right. Because all that matters is they you say, get like, you need to know, but they don't tell you how to figure it out or how to learn it. Right. Um, and I, you know, we're all, everyone deals with debt somehow. And it's really nice to hear that it, it seems like you guys who are teaching students are very aware that this conversation needs to happen, I, I, it seems very, like it's almost an ethical conversation, like as a teacher of music, you, when you know that students are taking on so much debt to study with you, it's almost part of your responsibility as the teacher, even if you're, you're just t supposed to teach them how to play, what, freaking tambourine or something. But they're paying like eighty thousand dollars to Take learn that, how to Ted. play. Yeah. They're paying eighty thousand dollars to learn how to play a freaking tambourine. By okay. the way, I, I would segue there. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't know if you checked out uh, <laughs> by Ivan Offelich. It's uh, it's on the Black Swamp side. I hope you'll check it out. It's the second movement of his. Uh, Is this one with the, the piano? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Super yeah, cool. he's, yeah. He's a he's a great writer. He's a great yeah. writer. Yeah. What's yeah. it? I don't. I what, it. What's it called? Oh, it's a. It's called. The name of the piece is Opus Day. I played the second movement uh, as part of a demonstration of <laughs> Black Swamp Tambourines. Yes, yeah, his name is Ivan Ofelich. He's a Russian friend of mine. That's uh, cool, man. Like you can come on here and just like plug your stuff if you want. I guess that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I got other stuff to plug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you play tambourine and piano at the same time. Yeah, I did. I did. That's the way you wrote it. It's uh, it's cool. It's it's innovative. Yeah, Casey wouldn't know anything about that, so that's why he makes fun of it. This piece would be perfect cool, for Laurel. I'm sorry. Yeah, it'd be perfect for Laurel. Oh, for Laurel. Yeah. Well, Laurel didn't seem to be. She was making fun of playing the tambourine. Or <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Laurel is Laurel. calling out the teachers that that think You're calling us out. What you have to do is teach you music, and that that's it. But. You know, we've all been students, and we know that that's tricky you look too, at the teacher, like... but you look at them as a mentor, of course, in music, but also in some other ways, and chances are you're not coming from a family of performance musicians, so they don't know how to give you advice, but you depend on your teacher for that, because sometimes you go to the administration, and they're useless. We know that happens. Yeah. So... But like you could never bring this up with a student unless they asked you to. Like they would right. need they would need to come to you. It's not like something you could just say like, "So, tell me about your money." Like, you No, know, but you like, could make them aware of it like in a studio class or something. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I can give you an example of of a of a, a how I did that. Let this past week at Long Beach, um I've talked with a couple students about it. It's it's sort of the somewhat of the opposite problem in that all these students are taking on a bunch of different jobs. So some of them do work study, and some of them are doing uh, jobs outside. You know, one of them is working at Disney, and uh, you know, it, it's it's admirable that they're working so hard. But what's happening is that they don't have enough uh, money uh, saved up so that they can just focus on being in school. Right. Um, you know, my my I, I wish I had gotten so much more out of school. I wish I had gone to all my classes. I wish I'd learned more about economics and the psychology courses I took and. And uh, I think you only get one chance, and you want to make the most of it. So I'm actually having a slightly different conversation, which is to say, 
you have no student debt because Cal State Long Beach is, if you're in state, is incredibly affordable. But a lot of these people are telling me that they're not able to take out enough loans to cover their uh, living costs. So I'm realizing I need to start doing research and finding out if, you know, how much of this is true rather than just accepting the information that I'm getting from different students. So right. yeah, I, I think it's, it is, it's becoming uh, the teacher's responsibility, in my opinion, to know more about uh, you know, the, the situation with loans. And in addition to loan debt, what is available in loans? I actually, uh, Megan, you know more about this than I, but I get the sense now that certain loan companies are not giving as much in loans because of this uh, cycle that we're entering, which is that um, so many students are not going to be able to, to, to pay their debt. And, and we're not, again, we're not just talking about music majors, we're talking about all students. So I, I don't know the answers. <laughs> I'm not sure about, yeah, I, I don't know much about that, but I do know that they stopped giving, I think they stopped giving subsidized loans to graduate students. And what, like when I did my master's degree, I was able to get unsubsidized loans, but in my doctorate, I could only get, or no, sorry, I could get subsidized, but in my doctorate, I could only get unsubsidized loans. So that means that the interest is occurring while you're still in school. So you have no chance. You're just, it's like credit card debt, you know? I mean, it's lower than credit card debt, but it's a high amount of loans, so it mm -hmm. still is occurring, and you have no chance, you know? Whereas a subsidized I'm, loan, a subsidized loan, the, the interest is, they are covering the interest or not charging your interest. Right. It's you, waived right. for while you're in school. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And one other thing about the being full-time employed, um, I, I believe that you can have a combination of jobs that are in nonprofit. So, like, even if you're a freelancer and you are working, I don't know, say for some kind of organization where 501c3 status and you're, like, an administrator, for a nonprofit organization part-time and then you're teaching adjunct at a college and together you're able to put together 40 hours a week um, and prove that I think it still counts I was concerned about that um, but yeah as long as you're full-time in some capacity and also you could work somewhere for four years um, and then do something else in the private sector or something and then come pay normal and then come back to it and do another six years down the line and it still it works it just has to be um, 120 total qualifying payments oh. I yeah. kind of wish it was harder to get a loan it seems like it's so easy and it like like hearing you talk Megan you clearly like have been proactive and doing something about it and I just see so many people like not and they make it so easy it's almost like they should have to know that the person they're giving the loan to is going to be like you and like is going to finish their degree is going to go is going to likely succeed after their degree and is going to really like take take ownership of of paying it back um, but it seems like they hand them out um, like I don't know they almost just make it too easy I remember seeing the little college tent set up and they're just like, oh yeah, here you go, it's great. Your student ID has like a credit card on it, and like, yeah, just oh, it's it's no problem. You just pay that back later. It's no big deal. Like, and they they like, it's so automated. Um, so I don't know. And maybe it's oh, no yeah. big deal if you make a lot of money, but like, I think that most musicians are not gonna, you know, we're not gonna make a lot of money. So. Yeah. yeah. I remember seeing those uh, seeing those posters as a freshman, you know, where you could get your own Amex card, and I was just hungry to get that thing, and then then you've got a five thousand dollar limit, and you're thinking, wow, this is like almost having free money, and you just don't quite understand that, uh, you know, you're going to have to pay that back at the end of the month, and you figure it out pretty quickly, usually, um, but, uh, but yeah, I know I, plenty of people I went to school with got into big trouble with credit cards, because it's hard to understand what all that means when you've got this card that you can, you know, seemingly use anywhere, anytime. I've heard about students getting, like, it's so easy to get a uh, monthly payment on a fancy car. Like, they'll get a fancy car. Mm -hmm. They're like, I can totally afford the payments. Um, it's just super, super easy. It's all set up. There's not much thought involved. And then they get it, and, like, two years later, they have to pay the property tax on it. And they have to give the car back because they can't pay the just the, the property tax. Right. Yeah. Um, Yes. Anyway, anyway, crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, I would love to. I'd love to watch. Have have everyone watch this movie called Declining by Degrees. It's a documentary. I think you can watch the whole thing on YouTube. It's really, really interesting. It's like super long, but it's it's has all this stuff kind of in a, a big package. It's depressing. No, it's so good. It's like so good. 
I'd rather watch. Uh, I'd rather watch the Godfather trilogy. So no, I'm I'm not going to watch that. Yeah, yeah. That's not it, my um, type of film. Yeah, that's cool, Ted. You could just make fun of like me when I make bite you on and plug your stuff and uh, all that. <laughs> we <laughs> should uh, we should move to Laurel's segment. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, Laurel, take it away. Please. Yeah, Ted. I don't know. Do you have like some books you want to sell or something while you're here? I'll be over here practicing. <laughs> yeah, practice. Yeah, practice for the audition. <laughs> Sounds good. Sorry, I was just doing my thing, doing my orchestra jock thing. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Okay. So, well, the the little thing that I want to talk about today, it's maybe good it comes after all this talk about debt because it's a much more um, positive, uplifting topic. So. Thank goodness. Ted. Yeah. <laughs> Ted, yeah, nice touchy-feely, artsy-fartsy. Um, Ted, just so you know, my segment is about something that I'm reading that I choose to share with you guys. And I'm reading several books right now, but one of them is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And uh covered the first habit with... Um, where is my... Uh, I can't remember. Anyway, it's uh, being proactive is the first habit. The second one is called begin with the end in mind and in a way that relates to student loans. You know, know what you're getting into before you start. Um, but what I actually want to talk about was just one small part of this chapter. So begin with the end in mind is all about um, have an idea of your principles and where you want to go. And a really beautiful way of talking about that comes from Viktor Frankl, who is an author that was actually imprisoned at a Nazi death camp, and while there had this really profound human experience where he wrote a book about it called uh, Man's Search for Meaning, where he realized that they took everything from him except his own definition of what gives life meaning and so he wrote this really beautiful book and several really lovely texts but he talks about how each of us find whatever it is that gives our life meaning that gives us a direction and a sense of purpose from which we build the principles to move our life forward as we go um, and so Viktor Frankl says that you know we don't decide on a mission for our lives but rather we discover it as if like it's inside of us all along and we just have to wake up to find it and he has I'll be paraphrasing right now but he has a really beautiful uh, way of saying this and that he says each of us has a unique mission but more than that has an incredibly unique way to implement it that no one else has and um, I think that is something that I know I needed to be reminded of a lot in school as a young student and I know some people listening are certainly students but I know from talking to others that are you know older than me and, and going through another kind of who am I type phase we talked about this with Keith Aleo that um, we have to be really active sometimes in remembering or discovering who we're supposed to be or what our particular missions are um, because it can be so easy to think you know I'm in music school and well how have people been successful about this in the past well they've auditioned for orchestras or they've created chamber groups or they've been college teachers and we know that that works but what if you know the mission that you feel inside you is different um, and I'm one of those people, I think, and um, I'm not quite sure what it is, but I, I know more of what it's not. But anyway, hearing about, you know, Ted, what you said about the, the meaning of your percussion seminar and that it's about showing people the things that they could be, it seems like it's really in line with this and um, allows young players an opportunity to be exposed to things which makes it easier for them to discover whatever personal mission they have. Yeah, I, wanna, I yeah. think it's great. I, I, I wanted to add to that that I really had no idea, you know, where, where I would end up. And uh, it's still, it continues to evolve for me. And uh, it's been, <laughs> you know, 
I'm a little distracted by some of the type that's that's coming out on on the right of my screen. Yeah. Yeah. He is writing inappropriate things. Everybody, totally <laughs> inappropriate. I'm ready to do a, a gesture right here, but I'm gonna I'm gonna refrain because <laughs> I don't know who's watching this, and if my parents are watching, I'm just I'm sorry for for Casey and I'm sorry for Casey and for Casey's parents. and for Casey and for Casey and for Casey's parents. Yeah, who will be mortified? <laughs> mortified. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they should be ashamed. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to talk about important stuff here. We're trying, Casey. I'm trying, We're really trying. I'm trying to coordinate the yeah. schedule and the call. And You're coordinating this bullshit. Oh, <laughs> just oh, this stuff. oh, oh, God. Sorry, Mom. I don't. Dude, that's know. okay. I don't you know. didn't know that was okay. That's I, okay. That's okay. All right. <laughs> that's okay. I, listen, I just wanted to. I just wanted to say that, uh, Laurel, what you're saying, I think, is is incredibly important because there is the the path for me and 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 probably for all of us is constantly veering off in different directions. And uh, you know, I never knew that I would end up playing in the Chicago Symphony. I certainly never knew that I would quit the Chicago Symphony. And I never knew that I'd end up. Um, being a you know more of a uh, educator slash soloist slash songwriter, I, I just these are not things that I that I necessarily were was I was striving to do from the get go. It, it's constantly evolving, and I think setting yourself up for success, having a vision of of your dreams is important, but not being afraid to veer off from them is also critical to, to being successful as an artist, especially in this climate and in, 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 in this landscape uh, of where we are in, in the musical world. Yeah, and actually, if we could use that partially as a uh, segue to one of the questions we had on, on Facebook was from Michael Neumeyer, um, who said, Ted, please tell us about your experiences in NICO slash rock gigging versus your classical slash orchestral work, similarities and differences. And I have a little note to add to that. Um, Ted, I was hoping Ted wouldn't mention this, so I could mention it, but he already did. But Ted, of course, as we all know, played in Chicago Symphony Orchestra and then consciously made the decision that he wanted to leave the symphony and uh, play with his rock group, which he uh, sings and plays keyboard in. I always just figured he was the dumb drummer, but he actually sings and plays keyboards. The dumb part's true. <laughs> they got that right. Um, but I remember, and this happened in 2006 is when you left, right? Yeah. yeah. In 2006, I was in a lesson with a professor who I won't name. I'll tell Ted later if he's curious. But this professor told me the story that there's this guy named Ted Atkatz that had won the Chicago Symphony Orchestra job very young, played with him for a few years, and was leaving and was talking about it like he was like the most insane person for doing this. Um, and uh, I kind of like, for a second, almost like talked back to my professor and I was like, I think that's so cool that someone was bold enough to say like, okay, I played with one of the best symphony orchestras in the world. I enjoyed it, I had my fun here, but I have this other thing that I also think I'd really enjoy, and I'm going to go for it. I'm not going to be afraid to let go of this, like, you know, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity in the face of another potentially once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So anyway, could you tell us about gigging and how it's different? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all... Check out, Ben. Yeah, that was long-windish, that question. Uh, no, I, I, I appreciate that because uh, I never had any idea about how uh, divisive of, of a, you know, my move became. And, uh, you know, people, people in the Chicago Symphony, most of them were, were really supportive of, of it, and some were not. Um, I had people coming up. I had a, a, a high school teacher come up to me outside the hotel in Austin at PASIC in 2008, maybe, and he said, yeah, and you're Ted Atkatz. I've had a question that's been burning in my mind that, you know, I, I've been dying to ask you, what the, were you thinking? You know, what are you, what is your problem? And, you know, that, that's come up for me a number of times and other people who have gone in Ben's direction. Um, but, yeah, I, I, to, to start answering that question, um, I was just so inspired um, writing my own music and performing my own music. So, so I perform with the CSO, and you know, and there was, there would be you know 2,500 people in the in the hall, and then I'd go play at a small club in front of like 25 people. There's a uh, there's a news segment about this on YouTube, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, it's like a the Chicago News did a like a segment on this like this. Uh, oh, are we frozen? Oh no, I think we might be frozen. No. Okay, no. sorry, you were frozen. Um, but yeah, there's a Chicago News station that did a segment on on Ted Adcats and. He played at Symphony Hall, then like had a gig that night after the concert. Yeah, yeah, and wow. and it was yeah, it was it was really wild. But um, I found myself just being 
getting so much of a of a rush and, and a reward endorphin high from performing my own music in front of 25 people some of whom were receptive you know it was like it was it was really it was really cool for me and it was you know it's pretty much why you know why I got into music in the first place and I thought man if this is if I can have this much fun um, I should really go at this full tilt and so yeah I, I quit the orchestra and you know some would say it was hasty but I, I was pretty I was you know decided that I needed to do it right then that I, I didn't I, I shouldn't hold on for another minute I should let someone else who wanted to do that exclusively come in and do that because I think that job you know deserves the best and and, and the most attention uh, to to that that job so yeah so that's what I did um, but I would say that the things the similarities are that you're always trying to reach people with music it's not to say that you're always trying to make them happy but you're trying to reach them in, and make a connection and I, I think that's that's easily forgotten when we're in the practice room and we're we're delving into the minutia of getting our grace notes just right and learning all the notes in, in a particular section that's very difficult the average listener is not really all that focused on what's so difficult about playing four mallet marimba or about the the roughs in, in Kiji they really don't give a a shit. Can I say that, Laurel? I guess I can. Because yeah, you can say that. Right. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it was just so obvious to me. And even and learning about that as a performer with Nyko was to learn, like, it's not really that important to sing in tune. It's more important to, like, have the... <laughs> we, Casey says, this is getting boring to give me a wet willy. So, that's, so, what, that's what everyone is missing. To anyone watching, we always have a text group chat going on the side of this. <laughs> And normally it's pretty tame, but Casey is just going at it. <laughs> How's that for boring? How about some jazz? How about that? Come on, Ben, grow up, man. It's, I just I have no control. I'm done. I'm done here. But but anyway, the the differences the differences are that the number of people that come to the Chicago Symphony and the number of people that come to NICO, it's a multiple. From between NICO, it's a multiple of a thousand. So if you multiply the twenty-five by a thousand, you get twenty-five hundred people, and that's how many people come to CSO, and that's how many people come to see NICO. So it's it's math, simple math. That's I'd a like of a hundred, by the way. Oh, thank you. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> multiple of a hundred. You're right. It's you know, math, you math. know, it's simple math. I'm not good at math <laughs> or music. So something something I wanted to ask you guys at Taps, and I have, there's a question for you, for Matt Strauss, or for Sean Tilburg. Um, or, or any of the, the symphony cats, like, wh what was so different about, now I'm in a symphony, I've won the gig, like, like what was different than you you expected from when you were in your, like, audition peak? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think a lot of us were, were, were pretty naive in the fact that you practice all these excerpts and, you, and then you get into the gig and you're, you're waiting for, like, every week you're going to play, like, this big excerpt and stuff, and it was going to be just nonstop action. And then you find yourself going on tour to like all these incredible places and playing these amazing concert halls. And you're playing the triangle part on Bruckner 7. And if you know that piece, you play one triangle roll at the same time the cymbal player plays his or her one cymbal crash. And then that's in the second movement. And then you sit down and you're, you're done for the rest of the piece while all this music happens. So it does... <laughs> it... Um, yeah, it's Children. it's not sometimes it's, I'm sorry. Nothing. <laughs> Give him a wet willy. This is boring. Ha 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 ha. You're laughing. Come on, Ben. Don't laugh. And then it gets not And that I can't say not you you, the, Yeah, you can't say that. Yeah. 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 yeah so when when am I done here, Casey? This is like this is excruciating. You just keep making fun of me. You ask me questions and then you're not interested in the answer. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. There's seven more minutes. Can oh, I'm you laughing. Survive? I'm laughing too much. Uh, I think I'm we should move. my timer on this. Let's seven move to. Seven more minutes. No problem. Wait, I have a really important question. Oh yeah. For Ted. Yeah, please. Can I Wait. type? Will you do it? No. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it's said that you run long distance. As someone who wishes they could run, how do you not get? immensely bored while running long distance yeah it's actually um, it's actually real it's part of the part of the thrill of it and uh, 
Yeah, I actually found that I, I started, my thinking was became clearer in a run. So, like, I, I think I've never been diagnosed with any of the, you know, ADD or attention deficit disorders, but I, I do find when I was... You've got it. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think I do too. And, and uh, but getting on a run, I find that you, you have to find focus. And that was, that's part of the challenge of it is that so much of, like, long, you know, endurance racing is about your, your mind, mind over your body. And I think that's yeah. true. It's true in music too. So, um, yeah, for me, I, I never have a Walkman or, you know, a, a radio or anything with me. I'm just, I'm just kind of in my own head. Actually, a lot of, I've written a lot of music while on runs. Sometimes I actually, you know, remember it when I finish the run and write it down or, or record <laughs> it. Uh, but yeah, there's, it's, it, there's, again, it's like music. There are endorphins that are, that are firing and, you know, exercise creates some of that. So there's similarities there. So, so yeah, running for me is, gets pretty exciting. Although, yeah, sometimes it gets you know, incredibly boring depending on where your head's at and your body's at. I watch Casey Cangelosi YouTube videos while I'm on the treadmill. That's what I do Why? every time. Why? <laughs> That's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um... Fix me out. No, I don't actually do that, by the way. <laughs> You guys, I think I think we've gotten all the questions. I think we have to wrap. It looks like it's it's time. Um, I think I hope I, I don't have to edit out a thousand things. I think it's probably all okay. But um, dude, wow, Ted, really? is, can I can I ask? Uh, no, I think it's okay. Question? Yeah, open ended question for Ted. Can you tell us about the Christopher Rouse percussion concerto you played that I saw you play? Yeah, just a bit about the piece and your approach to it and all that sort of thing. Yeah, it's uh, it's called, uh, let's see my pronunciation, Daguerreotet Albrecht, so it's basically the, the return or the rise of Albrecht. So Albrecht's a character from The Ring, he's a little dwarf who renounces love and steals the gold. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, cliff noting the story, but um, he sort of, Christopher Rouse, I think, relates to that character and his outcome is sort of unknown at the end of the ring. So the concerto is basically you take on his character. At the beginning of it, you've got these guiros and you're you're basically simulating his voice and him waking up and laughing and grunting and um, but yeah the piece was a real challenge and uh, surprising to me at you know I I fell in love with it and it seems like audiences tend to dig it too. It covers a lot of ground. You end up playing uh, marimba and a big multi setup, and I mentioned Wiros and Steel Pan and drum set, and he has a portion that's like it's pretty much a Led Zeppelin ripoff. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think it's I think it's a great piece. It was written for Evelyn Glennie, and uh, it was really super challenging for me to learn it. And now um, now I'm, I'm I want to perform it again because it's uh, it's it's fun to do, and and orchestras like playing it too. And there's there's a video of you playing it on YouTube. Of, was it with C CSU Long Beach? Is that yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, it's a challenging piece for the orchestra too, but um, rewarding for the orchestra and for the audience. And, and yeah, I had a good time with it. Yeah. Cool. You guys and uh, everyone, Ted, thanks so much for joining us for episode seven. Uh, that was too much fun. We'll have to have you on again. Um, or I really hope not. Session. I, I'm never doing this again. As long as you're doing it, Casey. Yeah. Ben's great. And yeah. You ladies are fantastic, Laurel. Megan, thank you so much. Casey, <laughs> not so much, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool, man. We'll we'll put a we'll put a link to like your your book. I don't know. Do you have a book? Uh, something like that. You're not. No, I'm not plugging anything more. Oh yeah, check out Nyco N Y C O. Yeah, check them, <laughs> Check us out. They won't cost they are, anything on Spotify. They actually actually are very good, but I I'm gonna I'm gonna edit that out because. I'm not gonna tell anyone. Just bleep um, it. Just put the black sensor box over his mouth and just have a big old bleep. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I. I don't know if I have the technology to do that. But you have I, to do I, it live I, with the draw tool. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we should have messed yeah. with Ted. I should have messed with Ted oh, with the draw tool. Okay, cool. It's like it's like over there. Thanks a lot for not doing that. Thank you guys for having <laughs> me. This was great. It was great to to uh, see all of you and, and talk to you. Thanks a lot. Man, this was Thanks, bad. Ted. This was awful, man. All right. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Yeah. I'm sorry, too. <laughs> I'm sorry for Casey. Yeah.